All right, so let's go ahead and jump in to, this is the meat and the bones. So this is a little bit of a different concept to most of the way that we approach um, livestock and forage and fodder. I think most of the time we're concerned about our pastures. I want you to think about the six feet outside of your fence. So imagine if this area here is where you are all the cattle. So the cattle fence is, is right here. We'll just go straight across right here. The cattle is this way and this is the untouchable spot. I'm talking about planting outside of that fence line to where the things that grow are growing over your fence to where they have access, but they're not eating it all the way down. Uh, that is the most underutilized area in the entire pasture. And I would say arguably, it has the potential to be the most fruitful area of your pasture, both for you, but also for your livestock. So this is an incredible way to increase yield for your animal and your forage. If I were to tell you to do one plant on your farm, it is bamboo. 100%. And this one, people get violent about this topic in general. Well, it's going to be a runner. It's going to be a spreader. It's going to take over the world. All right, hold on to your horses, beloved. So not all bamboo is a runner. There are many types of bamboo that are genuine clumpers. I have literally, I met a lady, she's 80 some years old. She has a clump of um, graceful bamboo. That's the variety of bamboo. It is 11 feet, 12 feet across, and it is almost 50 years old. 50 years old, and it is 11, 12 feet across. Sea breeze is gonna be about 15 feet across. Bamboo, the reason why I love it, number one, bamboo is very high in silica. Very, very high in silica. And silica is basically the taxi cab that's gonna deliver nutrients of anything else that they're eating. So that's the carrier mechanism that's gonna give you minerals, gonna deliver the vitamins, that's gonna deliver the fiber. If you don't have silica, your the animals are not not able to get everything out of their food that they could be getting. So silica, number one. Okay, then number three on here increases milk production. So this is gonna be really good for uh, nursing moms for both humans and the livestock in general. So this time of year, really important for cattle because those calves are really taxing mamas a whole lot. If you've got goats and harvesting goat's milk, uh, this is really gonna be helpful um, for those. Uh, number four, for joint health. So the silica is really gonna be beneficial for the joint health on the animals and the livestock. So this is good for racing horses, for older cattle, older goats, uh, just to help their, uh, the joint health overall. Obviously it is in the grass family, so it's gonna be really high in fiber. So when we talk about varieties, varieties we have to kind of think about the usage that we're intending for this. So if you look at the sea breeze bamboo that's here, these have really long canes and combs and the leaves don't start until a lot higher. Up. So when we're looking at this variety, this is not going to be good for cattle forage because th they're going to be going after this stuff. I would use this on pasture if I'm trying to do a north wind hedge of protection to really block that wind from raging over the pastures. Great for around food forest edges because sea breeze is going to stay in a nice uh, 12 to 15 foot uh, kind of a clump and then you can still use the leaves and the branches and that sort of thing but really this is going to be for building material for structure the uh, next one in here is the fern leaf this is my favorite I think for animal forage because it's lower growing a lot bigger broader leaves on fern leaf um, so it's easier to hang over and through the fences or the fences and it can really easily be hedged as well graceful is probably my number one recommendation as far as um, livestock and pasture management because graceful is both good as a hedge of protection but it's also great because the leaves on graceful go all the way down to the ground they'll regrow back so you're really getting all of the benefit of those now graceful sea breeze fern leaf these are all very very clumping so I, I have a friend again who's you know 50 years old and her clump is 12 15 feet across and it's just just this huge massive clump but it doesn't spread it's not 
not running from pasture to pasture. It's not spreading into the neighbor's yard. These really are gonna stay, stay put. So again, if you're gonna do any of these eight plants along the fence line, bamboo is my number one. This is the Florida mineral block. This is our high silica, our high mineral content. This is probably my go-to, but again, this is probably one of the more feared plants uh, by people because of the stereotype in the Midwest of the running bamboo. So number one, bamboo. Plant number two is napier grass. One, that's just pretty. I mean, to have that beautiful burgundy on the edges of pastures is it's a showstopper. It's just really, really pretty. Bam, uh, the napier grass is 12% protein, 27% fiber, 58% of the nutrients are fully digestible, and look at the growth rate on napier grass. I did not believe this when I first did it because you read something on the internet and you realize, oh, I just read that on the internet totally works. I had this little problem scenario in front of this RV, sun was blasting on the RV, and I was like, well, if that's true, I'll put two of them right out in front of the RV and just shade the outside of that RV and just see what happens. I kid you not, in a month later, it was 10 feet tall. And another couple weeks, and it's literally 17 feet tall. Now, it will stay at about 17 feet, but if the cattle eat it back, it'll grow 17 feet tall in another 30 to 40 days. It is absolutely insane on the growth rate. It is not a spreader. Uh, I never let it go to seed. I just, I let the cattle eat it down before it goes to seed because the seed is kind of like cottony, you know what I mean? So it's not a good texture for the cattle, but they can eat that all the way down. What I like to do is let them eat it down to about here and then I take that much of it and I cut it for propagation, stick it in a pot of soil, and then I propagate a whole other round um, of napier grass. So napier grass there's, is the red. Uh, elephant grass is a little bit harder stem, but still has incredible uh, benefits. And again, these are great clumpers to do on uh, pasture edges. So I don't like to do any of these right by my water. You know, I wanna be able to have access to my water or be able to go visit. But especially where I want wind breaks, where I want a visual barrier, these are awesome to put in those places. Number three, this is probably uh, my, my second highest recommendation if I were to add one in because Moringa in other countries, they call it the tree of life, it has 92 minerals. This is literally a mineral block and has crazy amounts of protein and amino acids, vitamin C, vitamin E. I mean, this is literally just chock full of nutrients. Here's the one caveat with Moringa. Can you grow it from a cutting? Yes. Should you? No. Most greenhouses are selling you a cutting. So always make sure that you trust your supplier that you're getting it from a seed and here's why. Moringa, when it's grown from a seed, develops a taproot. Tap roots are never established once you cut from a cutting. A cutting is only gonna give you lateral roots. Are they gonna go down a little bit? Yes, nothing like a taproot will. The benefit of Moringa are those 92 minerals and nutrients that are only found when you get a true taproot that goes down below that uh, the clay band. So if you want the, the full spectrum of, of digestible nutrients, get your Moringa grown from seed, full of amino acids. This is edible and medicinal for humans. Every part of the tree is edible and medicinal. The leaves, I like, I don't like to eat them in a salad. They're a little peppery and horseradishy. I dry mine in my dehydrator and I do 50% Moringa, 50% sea salt, and you literally don't taste the Moringa. You use it just like you would use table salt and you get all the benefits of Moringa. I'm all about hiding the flavor. I don't like Moringa powder in a shake because the powder is hydrophobic. So it all floats to the top of the shake and you get this like, you know what I mean, it's nasty. So really good for cattle. They're gonna eat this like crazy. Um, I use it in the food forest as well, both as chop and drop. In a cattle scenario, I would not grow Moringa as a tree. I would either coppice it by cutting it really low to the ground or pollard at about three feet, just literally to a stake, because then it's gonna get bushier. Because remember, cattle aren't gonna be climbing trees. Now, if you have those fancy goats that get up in the trees, great, grow a tree. I'm primarily growing this to be big and bushy, let the cattle eat it, and whatever they don't eat, I'm processing. So in our context for livestock, I would recommend uh, doing it more as a, a hedge. Chickens can eat it. Uh, goats uh, love it. Sheep love it. Uh, horses love it. 
Ducks are the only thing that I have found that don't go for it really fast. They more like the snails and the slugs and the bugs and that sort of thing. But Number four, Mexican sunflower. This uh, website here, there's a couple links. In Africa, what they've done, I think it was the University of Maryland at Baltimore, is they took Moringa from the last one we talked about with Mexican sunflower, and in the, um, the Hala, or, um, Sahel version of Africa and Central Africa, where they have real problems growing grains and grasses, they grew Mexican sunflower and Moringa alone and are transferring all of their animal forage to these two plants as their primary source, and they have found no decrease in the health of the plants, or the health of the animals, the productivity of the pastures. They're still seeing the same marbling in the meat because again, look at the protein content, the digestible nutrients. Even though this one is not a bean peer legume, it uses a process called nitrification that it repairs atmospheric nitrogen into your soil. So this is literally a nitrogen fertilizer. So you're growing your own fertilizer on pasture. It is real pretty. I think it's a great pollinator. The big Big, um, the giant swallowtails love this thing. I mean, they'll be, you know, just flocking all over it. This will get pretty large. The diversifolia will get to be 15 to 18 feet tall at maximum height. Typically, if it's on a cattle edge, it's only going to get to be six or eight feet tall. The cattle eat it down six or eight feet tall. The livestock will eat it down. Rotundifolia is a seeding one. So this one here only grows by cutting. This one uh, is a self-seeder, so this one you can grow in pasture, and that one's only gonna be about three feet tall. The way you tell the difference is this is red, like a red-orange, and the diversifolia is gonna be a yellow. Uh, but both of them are, are equally usable on pasture. If you're wanting the self-seeding method, I would probably do the rotundifolia in pasture, and then the diversifolia outside of pasture. Chickens too. Chickens they more like the bugs that are at the base. They'll peck at the leaves occasionally, but they don't, they don't love the leaves of it. And now, if you cut it down and throw it in their coop, like I would with like Moringa, then they'll go after the leaves. No. Hey, Chris, mention, yeah. mention that it freezes back. <laughs> yeah, that one and Napier grass, the first frost that you get, that will freeze back. Now, Napier, they will still eat. Um, Mexican sunflower, they'll eat for a couple of days after the frost, and then they just kind of leave it alone after that. Uh, number five, pigeon pea, and there is a northern adapted pigeon pea that is more cold hardy, grows faster, and fruits, uh, seed the stars, um, does have that available. Pigeon pea, the leaves, the beans, and the flowers are edible for humans and livestock. 19% protein, again, it is in the leg legume family, it's a Fabiaceae, so it's repairing nitrogen in the soil. You can eat the beans, I don't love the flavor of them, and honestly, to me, I just think pigeon pea are a pain in the butt to harvest. You'll get a huge bowl of them and you have to shuck the dried beans and literally I'll watch a movie and shuck a bowl and you get like a little jar of them. I just don't have time to do that. So for me, this is a great chop and drop in the food forest. It's great for animals. Can you eat it? Sure. Do I? No, pretty much never. I'll just buy the Goya bag when I want to, you know, when I want to do that. But it is pretty good for pollination. Flowers, you can get in the red or yellow or a white, um, so it doesn't matter. The sixth one for our fence line, uh, food forest area is mulberry. Uh, mulberry berries obviously are edible for humans. They're like the sweetest blackberry you've ever had in your life, but no seeds. Uh, not all mulberries are the same flavor. Uh, the white mulberry is my favorite. It's about an inch and a half long, and it tastes like vanilla cotton candy. Uh, if you get the dwarf Thai red, uh, that one is more sweet and tart. Uh, the dwarf ever-bearing mulberry, which is this one here, is smaller, but it's really, really sweet. So a lot of, a lot of good benefits of those. For humans, it's really the antioxidants, the anthocyanins, the vitamin C. The same nutrients are available in the leaves as forage and fodder. Chickens will not eat the leaves. Ducks will not eat the leaves. They will eat the berries. You'll literally see their cute little bodies. They'll be like jumping and trying to like peck the berries if you're growing it as a bush. It is hilarious. Um, but cattle, horses, donkeys, uh, llamas, uh, they'll all eat the green. Um, as, as fodder and forage. 80% digestible nutrients. This is probably the highest in here as far as the nutrients that are gonna be bioavailable to the animals themselves. Um, and what's nice is these will fruit in Florida for us 
you know, quite a few times a year. So like the dwarf everbearing, uh, overbearing by mistake, so dwarf everbearing, you'll get about six harvests a year of berries on them. Uh, Ching Mai 60, uh, dwarf Thai Red, and the dwarf Shah Reza, those you'll get about four harvests of mulberries a year. But if they stop fruiting, literally just give the bush a trim and then it'll start fruiting again really quickly. Now in a, a fence line setting again, like Moringa, I don't want it to be a huge tree I want it to be a bush and you don't have to nice trim them I'm talking take the hedge trimmers and give it a haircut right off the top let the branches fall on the ground and then whatever you know hangs over the fences that's available for the animals everything on the other side is going to be your uh, kind of regrowth area for uh, livestock, this is going to be probably the fastest growing of the dwarf varieties. My favorite tasting are probably going to be these two here if you're talking about human uh, consumption. Um, greenhouses that have them, I know this one is available at a natural farm down the road. Uh, these two are available... Uh, with uh, Randy at Growing Earthly. I have no idea who has that. This was my plant of the year. I allow myself one healthy addiction a year because it's way better than having an unhealthy addiction. Mulberries was my addiction this year, so I have 17 varieties of mulberries. I got them all in a spreadsheet with the growing zone and the flavor palette. I'm like nerd level 10 on mulberries this year. So the next one is Passion Vine. This one is one of those, be careful with it. This is mildly edible for most livestock, but should not be given free choice because it does have some chemical compounds in this, um, that, like a cyanide um, that is gonna give them some stomach upset, but the benefits I think outweigh the, the cons, the pros outweigh the cons. So the rind of the fruit are great uh, for rumen health. So when you're done eating the fruit, toss the rind of the fruit into the cattle feed. Uh, the leaves of this are the ones that have the cyanic acid in it, but as far as like pollination sources, these are gonna really help attract bees, butterflies, braconid wasp, and brassicoid wasp. Those two beneficial wasp are wonderful for pasture health because they're gonna go after the caterpillars and inchworms that eat your grasses down. And in Florida, we do have some problems with those. At my friend's house, there was one year that there was, a, I think it's about five acres in front of the house that they had a, a, I'll call it a blight, an infestation of these caterpillars. And over about three, four, three to five days, you could see the caterpillars, almost like a controlled burn in the pasture where they were literally coming down the road and we sprayed basic H and neem oil and it literally stopped those suckers dead in their tracks. I mean, they were just, they'll devastate an entire pasture in a very, very small amount of time. So the brassicoid and braconid wasp will actually, uh, they'll, they're like parasites. So they'll go after those bad caterpillars. Um, so a couple of native ones. The native one here is the Incarnata. I like the flavor of purple possum, but I do think these are really pretty as far as around the pasture edges. And then sugarcane. This is basically our sweet feed. This is our molasses. Uh, the only thing I would not recommend is avoid the green and the yellow. Those tend to spread a little bit too rapidly. I feel like those are a little bit more on the invasive side. The red and the black uh, really do stay put pretty well. Uh, these can be given free choice. Uh, they're gonna go after bamboo and this the fastest because of the high silica and the high sugar content in those. 86% uh, digesti uh, digestibility and it's just full of minerals and nutrients so this is literally you know it's our mineral block it's our molasses it's our sweet feed so instead of you know buying a mineral block for 15 to 18 dollars why would we not just grow it and then it's perennial and it comes back and you've got one on each corner of your pasture and you maybe you section off a corner and then once it gets eaten down pull a fence across and you block it off for a little while and then you open another one. So it's a really easy way to give that sucrose um, to, your, uh, to your livestock. Are there some varieties that's more cold tolerant than others? We're right there. Yeah, I've not really found, they typically will come back, but they will die back. Now, if you can't do it, the slide at the very beginning, there was a bunch of other ones like the uh, maple or acer palmatum. There's a lot of other 
plants that you can grow that have good sugar content. Even the mulberry leaves have a pretty decent sugar content as well. Now typically what I do, so imagine the fence line and we're gonna go out and do this and see it and plant it and all that stuff. So once you've got them all in, I don't like bare ground uh, or just dirt or whatever laying there. I wanna keep everything covered. I typically will try and cover with something. We're not gonna plant those today uh, because I wanna wait until right before a rain and, and seed that stuff in. Some of the things that you can do, sweet potato vines are fantastic for forage and fodder. Cows and horses and donkeys love sweet potato vine. They can have as much as they want of it and it is not gonna hurt your crop underneath of the soil. I don't even plant this necessarily just for my own consumption. It's primarily for them, but also because a sweet potato vine will grow under the fence and you don't have to weed whack around the fences. It's a smother crop, which I absolutely love that aspect because I'm lazy. I don't want to be weed whacking all my fences all the time. And the vines don't climb. They stay on the ground. So it's really going to be a great smother crop. Longevity spinach is another great one that they can have access to. Comfrey, fantastic. If you want a good comfrey, Bocking, B-O-C-K-I-N-G, the number 14, you can get uh, little root propagations of them online, and I'll send you a link to somebody that I get mine from. This is literally a mineral block in a plant. It will grow to be this big, they can eat it to the ground, and you cannot kill it. Unless you have hogs that are gonna literally dig it up, that is the only way you're gonna kill a comfrey plant. Uh, also, if you wanna buy it locally, Mama G's Farm um, in Eustace does have it, so Melissa cultivates a really good variety as well. Chicory, great mineral miner, uh, great for animal forage and fodder. Clover, gotta be a little careful with um, if they're not used to it because of the moisture content. Diacon radish is another good one. Uh, these are great even for chickens, uh, fantastic for chickens. I'll plant these type of things outside of my chicken run and whatever grows in the chicken run they get, whatever's outside is free game for me or chop and drop or whatever. Um, so those are my favorite for ground covers. As far as my, my my staple, my go-to uh, cover crop for the summer, because we can't grow crap here in the summer. Pretty much like May, you know, through about now, we're not doing a lot of seeding our pastures this time of year, not a lot. There's a few things, but not a lot. Sun hemp, if you plant sun hemp the first or second week of May, you can get two, three, sometimes even four rotations of the cattle uh, grazing on it if you take them off in time. If they eat it to the ground, then you're tanked. But if you get them off in time, you can get multiple grazing rotations, and every time they eat it back, it releases that nitrogen into your soil and you're fertilizing your pasture four times. How much does it affect the nitrogen level? I'll let you know because we soil tested at the beginning and we'll soil test at the end. Um, so we'll be able to see how the nitrogen levels go. So they say that it works, but I'm all about, let's, let's get some numbers, let's get some data, let's see how it happens. I will say this, there's only been one time in my life besides YouTube or a TikTok video, that I have watched cattle go into a field and jump all four feet in the air and fling their feet out on both sides. It was like, a movie. I mean, it was unreal. We were literally, Josh and I, cracking up laughing on the golf carts because these cattle are jumping six, eight feet in the air. They were so happy. They're frolicking through the sun the first time we let them in. I mean, it was, it was hilarious. And they were, I mean, they were mooing and they were, oh, it was just fantastic. But I've never seen a crop that they are so happy to get. And how great of a crop is that? I mean, it's, I feel like I'm giving them organic juice and not a crispy cream donut, you know, and they love it. So absolutely fantastic. But again, that's the one we were talking about. You have to feed it before it flowers and before it fruits. But if you are, you know, out in your field and you're watching it, what a fantastic way to fertilize, feed your uh, pastures and cover crop and introduce bioavailability. Yeah, I use the EM4 or EM20 inoculant. Uh, most places will sell it. I know Hancock Seed Company sells the inoculant and it's, I think, used to be eight bucks. I wanna say it's 14 bucks now for a bag of inoculum. And it, you can do it without inoculum. You just get a better germination rate if you use the inoculant. So last couple things and then we're gonna head outside. Um, is wildflower mixes and what I call wonder blocks because it makes you want to go out in your pasture. And honestly, to me, family is not just important, family on the farm is everything. If you've got something for the wife to appreciate, 
you're gonna go out together. If you've got a place for the kids to play, to enjoy, to pick some flowers, you're gonna go together as a family. So this is good, number one, for the family. And I think that's the biggest gift that wildflower blocks give. And it doesn't have to be a lot. You might only plant three or four feet outside of the pasture edges, and that's the wildflowers. Now, as a farmer, we can still feel good about it too because we're increasing birds, pollination sources. Uh, it's a more biodiversity for them to eat because if you think about those animals in the wild, they would have had access to those in the prairies anyway. Those wildflowers would have existed. Most of the mixes are not, I have not seen any mixes where they've put something in there that's poisonous because they're all native stuff anyway. Most of the non-natives are the ones that we actually have to worry about, but fantastic for pasture edges, really good for the herd. And if they eat it down, great. If they leave it, Great, you get flowers to pick. And honestly, a lot of them, like this guy here, Echinacea purpurea, is edible and medicinal. Really good tea, great for the immune system. Scarlet bee balm, it tastes like bergamot tea. So there's a lot of really good usable things that are you know, in these mixes that I think are fantastic. Now you can buy wildflowers by pot, but if you go to you know, a local greenhouse, you're gonna spend eight or $10, $12 for one plant. Just buy it by seed, you know, and just follow the instructions there. The companies that I like for these. American Meadows is pretty good. Um, I love the mixes at uh, Hancock Seed. Hancock Seed has a quail mix that's got some really good wildflowers in there. But you can choose your sun exposure, uh, soil type, and then they'll tell you what seed mix is gonna do the best for you. You can even choose it by height. If you want a five foot tall wildflower mix or if you want an 18 inch tall flower mix. Got some cool options there I feel like. And again, I just, I think there's so many benefits to having those, those wildflowers around those pasture edges. It's more of a, why would we not introduce that to our ecosystem in general? I mean, even practically, I'm a bird nerd. I love watching wild songbirds and they're so beneficial out on pasture. I mean, literally those songbirds are insect control. So mosquitoes, cattle horn flies, those songbirds are eating the maggots that are inside of the cow patties, which is preventing, you know, the, um, the horn flies from even getting there to begin with. So the more of those wild songbirds and insects that you can attract, it's not just about being pretty, it's actually about the functionality um, of it well. So again, I wanna go back to kind of where we started is that hopefully these things are not only gonna be visually appealing, not only gonna be good for your cattle, for your livestock, but I also hope that it helps close our supply loops a little bit. I think as farmers, we've been a little isolated for a long time, uh, as far as not just getting out into the community, but also, you know, we're, we're, we're relying too much on other people to supply for our system. If they told us tomorrow that the feed mill closed down, would our animals be okay? would we be able to adjust and adapt our system? And I'm not saying that crap is gonna hit the fan and everything that's gonna collapse, but if it did, I want my animals to be ready, I want my family to be prepared, and I want my ecosystem to still be able to do well if I got sick, if I had to step back, if the bagged feed was not available. I want my ecosystem to not just get by and survive, I want it to thrive at the end of the day. So any questions before we go outside? Question about the winter. So yep. we've not been through a winter with the sheep yet. So how much of this is going to survive and or what are the hardest months and do we just have to go to hay for a little while or what, what do you think? <clears throat> Depends on what what mix you choose. Now in a lot of like the bag mixes, things like millet, sorghum, milo, the beans, the winter peas, a lot of the legumes, sunflowers are kind of average. Most of those are gonna be just fine. On the fence line stuff, a lot of them will be fine. So your napier grass is gonna be fine. If we get to 22 degrees or something, it'll die, but you can cut it up as roughage, just like dried hay or whatever. Um, they won't like it as much, but it's still edible. Moringa is probably going to die back. Mexican sunflower will die back. Some passion vine will, some will not. Purple possum will definitely die back. Incarnata, depends on how cold, you know, for incarnata. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a little hit and miss. 
you know, but I would say by and large, most of these will be able to withstand the frost. Mexican sunflower and moringa, those are the bamboo. two, or bamboo, real cold hardy. Bamboo, you can grow way up into Gainesville, North Georgia. Bamboo is gonna be great. Now I would get your bamboo in the ground now, so it has time to root in, so it's pretty well established. And then the other thing with bamboo is wood chips, wood chips, wood chips, like a couple feet deep of wood chips. They love fungally dominated um, soil and area, especially to get started, but bamboo is very cold hardy. And the nice thing with bamboo is that will block your north wind so you can protect some of those more cold sensitive things in the middle of your property. What about ryegrass? Ryegrass is okay. Annual or perennial? Yeah, that, that is one of those, it depends. Um, even the annuals I find a lot of times will reseed. Now, not at the same rate that you put it in the ground, but a lot of the um, annual ryegrasses will end up reseeding. If it's far enough along, it'll just die back, fall to the ground, and then come back up in usually about three months. Um, the perennial ones are a little more frost sensitive, but they almost always come back. They have a little more... A little, little more zing. Bigger, bigger They're also a little more, a little more money too. Yeah. Yeah, very cheap. And so is like winter wheat, red winter if, wheat. If you have irrigation, it's a very good overcrop. Uh, yeah. Because you can put it in, you know, mid-November, and if you irrigate, because we're not getting any rain yeah. then, but if you keep it irrigated, you can keep good growth on it. Oh, yeah. Through March. Yep. Uh, April, May is going to, the sun's going to cook it out. Cook it out a little bit. But yep. by then your behead. It's all kicking back in. Yep. Yeah. Right. Stuff around the edges because we have domestic dogs and we have kind of right. everything digging in. So, and the fact that uh, it's <coughs> soft and sloped, and so we're retaining Just that Holding sand, that sand, you know, yep. And keeping a barrier from digging. Oh, that's good. Yep. So, to plant around those edges. That's great. Part, oh, yeah. I didn't even think about that. You know, the erosion. Yep. Control, yep. Man. Critter control. And those drenches, I yep. mean, they're, they're caving out deep. Oh, yeah. Yep. And honestly, I feel like, especially with all the construction in the last three or four years, the wild dogs and the, the predators are increasing so fast. It's like anybody with land, we're inheriting everybody else's bears and coyotes and bobcats, and I swear there's a Florida panther in our area. <laughs> I, everybody told me I was crazy two years ago. They're like, no, there's not, no, there's not. I'm telling you, like the number of farmers, and I've got like three, two or three pictures on my deer camera that I'm like, that is a tail. Now it's not a quality enough picture for me to like post it and prove it, but I'm like, uh, best son Dave and I, we joke about it all the time. He's like, bro, no you're not. No you're not. I'm like, dude, I'm telling you, that is a tail. That is a tail. So that's, you know. And then another good source for seeds, if Hancock doesn't have it, mm -hmm. I love that place. I love yeah. to go and look at their They got a cool place. And they have the best bathroom ever. But anyway, <laughs> they, uh, it's Hostels is a southern uh, oh. farm that they do southern pasture. Okay. Crop What's it called? Okay. Georgia, okay. Yeah, um, that's a good one. That's good. Any other questions? Then we're going to go outside. Where do you stand on Katook and lemongrass? Katook and lemongrass. Lemongrass, great uh, in a cattle or a horse bridal way. So, and I can show you outside. Lemongrass has really high oils and terpene content, so it can really make animals sick, really make animals sick if they eat it. Brushing up against the animal, like if I'm running them through a cattle shoot or a cattle run where they're not grazing, they're just rubbing against it, fantastic for deflying like amazing for deflying. So it, like literally outside of your cattle chute, you know, do a couple lemongrass, cause they ain't, they ain't eating when they're going through a cattle chute, they're in freak out mode. So you're bringing them through the chute and they rub against it, awesome. Um, Katook is really good. That was one that I, I debated on putting in here. That does die back to the ground, but Katook is fantastic for milk production. So if you've got lactating goats, cows, horses, or not horses, um, sheep, 
put them on Katuk. And even for women that are having trouble like lactating, great for the prevention and treatment of mastitis as well. So Katuk is really good. Because it's so high in calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus, and potassium, I don't put it on them all the time. But like right now, when, when those mamas are really getting worked hard, it's a great time to be doing Katuk. And you could do that free choice. There's no... Um, uh, no cyanide or anything like that in it that they can't have. Okay. Yep. Nope. I just had a big clump of uh, vetiver grass dropped off by a friend. He, uh, he doesn't have animals, but he knew we had the goat. Right. I don't believe, I think that one has too high of an oil content as well. I would try that in very moderation, because even like as an essential oil, that's some potent stuff. It like no makes patchouli look weak, and patchouli will put hair on your chest. <laughs> you know the hippies are in town when you smell the patchouli. <laughs> okay, so cattle are over here right now. <coughs> they do come on this side of the pasture. So there's a lot of ways that you could approach these cattle fence line plantings. If, for example, this was your backyard, i.e. my house is literally right there, and you didn't have cattle in the backyard, then you don't need to put any fence line up. There's no reason to have a barrier here. You're good to go. You put your trees in, then you put your ground cover in, done and done. However, if cattle are gonna be on the other side, once it's planted, you can either do like a double hot wire. It only needs to be there for a year and then you can take it off. Or you can just do another line of fencing to where it's fully fenced in on both sides. To me, that's a lot of work. Now, cause it doesn't need to be <coughs> fully protected after the first or second year, these plants just need to get established before they get eaten back. So really you've got to think about your site. So when people go, well, how do I do it? Well, that depends. <laughs> you know, there's always variables in this stuff and it could be variables like this goes up slope quite a lot. So I don't want to do things that love water, i.e. my bamboo. I want to do the bamboo down where it's going to have good wet feet, but I want to do things that can tolerate the dry that are up slope a little bit. Also things that I'm thinking about, because that's my backyard, I don't wanna be looking out and seeing a wall of plants. I want my taller stuff this way because my sunset is right over there. So I don't wanna block my sunset. So really when you do this at your place, you've gotta think through some of those variables. What's my line of sight? What's the soil like? Is there water access over, over there? If there's no water access at all, you're not gonna be doing bamboo. That, that's not gonna do well in a purely dry area. You're gonna be focusing on Mexican sunflower, moringa, uh, pigeon pea, mulberry, things that don't need any water. You can pop them in, you can forget about them, and you are done and done. So there's a lot of ways that, that you can choose and select your plants for this. This row right here is one complete system of those eight or so plants that we talked about. This is one of every one of those. My goal in doing this is, I don't necessarily think this is how everybody needs to do it. I just don't wanna to have to walk people all around the entire 265 acres to show them an, an example. I wanna go, oh, you want an example of a fence line? Here's the eight plants you can use. Oh, look, they're all in my backyard. And I get to eat them, I get to enjoy them, you know, whatever. Most of the time, you might do 150 feet of just Napier. Or you might do Napier Mexican sunflower, Napier Mexican sunflower. So for example, in front of the sale barn, I don't want things that are gonna look ratty like uh, Moringa. I mean, they look neat in a food forest. I don't want a wedding picture in front of that dumb thing. It looks <laughs> stupid. I want the burgundy Napier grass or like a beautiful bamboo. I want it to look really good so I can still have my fun, but also have the function. You know what I mean? So you really got to consider for you, your scenario, your livestock, your line of sight. There's a lot of variables that will come into play. So these plants here, just as a review. So that one is a bamboo. The reason I have it over there is because that one is old hami. The canes and the combs are going to be about four to five inches across. Great timber bamboo. Uh, it's also really wet down there in that gully. So it's going to have infinite access to water. Um, so the tall big guy is going to be down there. The next one is a Tice mulberry, T-I-C-E. Uh, that's one of two native mulberries to the state of Florida. Uh, this one in particular grows more like weeping, kind of bushy mulberry, not a large tall tree. So it's gonna hang over the fence really nice to give them that access. The leaves on Tice will get to be like dinner plate size. They get to be a really big leaf. The fruit just tastes like the traditional black mulberry to me. 
The sugar cane here is a black sugar cane. Again, it's down here because I want that to have access to the water. Uh, this little guy is a pigeon pea. This is the yellow northern adapted. These are two of the uh, napier grass that were grown from uh, cuttings. The moringa is going to be here. You can keep coming down. Let's stand in the shade. This is the Mexican sunflower. Now again, remember, these look really small right now, but give these a couple months and they're going to fill in really, really nicely. Now, I didn't do any tall guys down here. One, because I don't want to block the view of my sunset. Two, I want access to these mineral and feeding stations. I don't want those to be getting in my way. So everything here is going to be smaller. It's going to be a little bit lower to the ground um, than this area here. So what I like to do when I do these plantings, I never want to plant in front of a fence post because if you have to do fence repair, that's going to be a pain in the butt to get around those plants. So I center my plants not only in the lane in the middle, but centered in between two posts. I don't know any farmer that actually measures between fence posts. We all just kind of go and just stick it in the ground, but they're about the same-ish distance apart. You'll notice more of the farmer uh-ohs between our fence posts now, but once all this fills in, you're not gonna see any of those mistakes. But again, I wanna center between the posts because I want access to be able to do my fence maintenance. And I try, if you're in a scenario where, um, uh, or like this where the cattle are only on one side, this side here is where the fence has to come off this way. Don't have the fence come off this way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if I have to replace this, this panel at some point in time, I don't want to have to cut down every tree to access from this side. So what side of your fence should you do it on? Again, that falls under the category of it depends. So any questions on this one here? This line? So once these get in the, <clears throat> in the ground today, um, I'll come back through with a cover crop and just hand seed that cover crop in. And because, you know, these fence lines are so long, if it grows, it grows. If it don't, it don't. Great, but it's enough to kind of get it started. Down here, the couple things, there's some sweet potatoes, longevity spinach. That's just gonna be a good ground cover. And again, I want shorter stuff because I wanna be able to see the sunset. So this is the only area here that has one of everything. So one team will be doing this area. Ground. Just to do a quick planting demo, if you wanna help me uh, do a demo, if you're doing a two-person system. Again, come on a little bit closer. We're gonna go in the middle of the lane in the middle of these here. One person can go ahead and dig a hole while the other person is trying to get them out of the pot. I realize if it has a tap root, you know, it may or may not be able to stay. If you got a pocket knife, that's fine. The general rule in Florida is plant it high and it will fly, plant it low and it will grow slow. So please don't bury it all the way down to here. Leave it up a little bit. Now on a couple of these, those of you that know Mexican sunflower, you could bury this sucker up to here and it's still gonna do fine. But most <laughs> fruit trees, berry bushes, you know, those things, they like to be planted up a little bit. So you're gonna measure it in your hole, add in some if you need to, put the dirt back around the side, and then just give it a good little stomp in, and then move on to the next plant and uh, head all the way down.